Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land, it's 2024 and in this video we're going to go through 12 excellent classics which you might want to read this year, especially if you're trying to get into the classics. So without further ado, let's dig in shall we? For the first book on this list of classics for 2024, I thought I'd pick a real humdinger which practically everyone can enjoy. It is the mesmerising, the mysterious, the breathtaking The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. What a brilliant book. It's not a murder mystery, but it is a great thrilling mystery. So the plot goes like this. Over in India, back in the 1700s, there is a temple with a god in it, and the god has set in its forehead a yellow diamond um, the size of an egg. And it glows brighter when the moon shines on it, so it's called the moonstone. And one of the gods has told three of the Brahmins that there should always be three Brahmins watching over this stone, to never leave it, to always be where it is. So when it's later stolen in its history, three Brahmins find their way to be in the palace where it's been taken to. But late in the 1700s, the British stormed the palace at Seringapatam, and someone amongst the troops loots the diamond. They take it, and it passes into their family. That's the intro, and then we jump into the story where we find that the diamond has gone missing two years before, and are trying to work out what exactly happened. And Wilkie Collins, as he did in Woman in White, uses different characters to write their own remembrances um, as if they're taking it to court so that we can work out how the diamond was stolen, where it's gone. But during all this, we find three Indians turn up in the local village because they are the ones that are keeping the eye out for the stone. How does it all turn out? Who stole it? How was it stolen? Well, you'll have to read this book to find out, and believe me, you will love it. The second book on our list of classics for 2024 is another masterpiece of a work, and it is John Steinbeck's East of Eden. John Steinbeck thought this his magnum opus, his greatest piece of writing. So it's hard to actually nail down the plot to this because there's a lot in it, it's about 700 pages. But we have two families that we're introduced to in the Salinas Valley in California. They are the Trasks and the Hamiltons. Um, they have a differing past, a differing economic setup, and yet their lives become deeply intertwined, sometimes proving very fruitful, sometimes proving rather fateful. Um, and essentially, the idea behind this, because Steinbeck tends to always come from some idea he's learned from other literature, this is a replay of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and then the story of Cain and Abel, the brother who killed his other brother out of jealousy. I can't say more about this. You just have to read it. One of the things you will love about this book is just how brilliantly it is written. Steinbeck was a master wordsmith. He can evoke atmosphere like not many other people can do. Also weaves an incredible story that leaves you thinking upon the creative nature and spirit of human beings and what we're really made of. So that was number two, East of Eden by John Steinbeck. The third book on our list of classics for 2024 is a Thomas Hardy book. I love Thomas Hardy, um, but it's one that used to be popular. It seems to have fallen out of favour recently. I don't know why. It is The Return of the Native. In this book, Hardy does some of the best scenic descriptions you will ever read. The, you know, even the opening page is marvellous. Um, but he also gets a great tale involved as well. And typical of Hardy, there's that element of suffering and difficulty, the human condition that finds things difficult, travails and happenstance which can affect lives. Now, in this book, you start getting to see some of the villagers holding a bonfire, um, and then you learn that outside of some of the villages, up near one of the hills, lives a woman called Eustacia Vi and her dad. And she doesn't really like being in the countryside. She prefers the vivacity and the excitement of the city, but she's beautiful. And quite a number of the men like her. There is 
someone else who is supposedly going to get married to a man right at the beginning, but they return from the town without actually getting married. And then you learn how their lives interact with this Eustacia Vi, whom some people think is a witch. Then comes the native, which is a man called Klim Yeobright, who has been living in Paris and is now returning from a very prosperous job to live back in Egdon Heath, which is the area this takes place. He meets Eustacia Vi as well, and has an impact on her. What you'll find as this book then unfolds is the interactions of the characters, and then the self-collapse of several of them, one after another. The role of circumstance and happenstance and our inner emotions and expectations and what they do to us is brought to the fore with some of the most beautiful, beautiful writing. Um, I really recommend this book. The fourth book on our list is a really good book, but it's one most people either overlook or haven't even heard of, and it's by Leo Tolstoy. It's his third great novel. It's not War and Peace, it's not Anna Karenina, it's Resurrection. I actually thoroughly enjoyed this book, and I'll, I'll make a few comments about it later, but the plot. It starts with a courtroom scene where there is a woman called Katya, um, a prostitute, who is up there to be judged for whether she's committed murder or not. And in the, in the jury, there's a guy called Nekliadov who immediately recognises her as a woman that he seduced when he was younger, leaving her with a bad reputation and propelling her into a life of vice and prostitution. And he feels quite bad. Now, she's convicted of murder on a technicality, but wants to prove herself innocent. Nekliadov has a conscience problem with how this woman's got to the state that she's in, and that it's a technicality that's put her, you know, in prison for murdering. And he sets about trying to, could you say, make amends? Perhaps. What we get through this story, though, is a great look at some of the prison systems in Russia, which were not too dissimilar to other prison systems around the world. There's a critique of the criminal justice system, which is still valid to some degree even today. But more than that, like much Russian literature, it focuses on how our worldview influences our actions and the way society works. This book isn't necessarily for everyone, but I personally think it's a really, really good read. So uh, that's the fourth work. If you've never read Tolstoy, a good introduction, um, this or the death of Ivan Ilyich, um, to his writing, because, yeah, he's just such a brilliant writer. So that was number four, Resurrection by Leo Tolstoy. In fifth place, is there a better backdrop for an exciting book than the French Revolution? You know, all of that upheaval and change, the bloodthirstiness, the running away if you're an aristocrat, uh, the vying for position if you're amongst the, you know, sans culotte. The book we're looking at is a very exciting read, and it is The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Auxy. Now, this is not the best written book in the world, but as far as a story goes, man, it's exciting and has lasted on the strength of the story. So we have the aristocrats right at the beginning of the French Revolution trying to flee because Madame Guillotine has been introduced. And you have a guy um, set up by the assembly called Chauvelin and his job is to capture and make sure aristocrats are brought to justice. But someone from over the seas in England, a gentleman, is coming across and disguising himself in order to rescue the aristocrats from under, under the nose of the police, the secret police of the French terror. But the question is, will he be able to last the whole book without being caught? Um, will his identity be discovered? Will the identity of those who work with him be discovered. And what about romance? Who, where does that come into this book? Because there is romance in it. This is just high flights of fancy, swashbuckling, intrigue, spying, daring, um, tales of daring do, absolute riveting, riveting read. Again, not the best written book, but darn good story. The sixth book takes it down a notch. This is a very moving book, a very thought-provoking, introspective book that can really churn you up. 
and is a bit demanding at times as well if you want to really stretch yourself. And it is F. Scott Fitzgerald's Tender is the Night. I love this story. I love the way it develops. It's a masterclass in characters and how they develop. So Rosemary, an, an American actress, after doing a scene where she dives into a river in Venice, she gets the flu or a cold or something, and she goes to take a break in the French Riviera in the sunshine at Hotel Gauss, where the owners are Dick and Nicole Diver, an American couple who have set up this hotel, and they are very welcoming to other people, and they are charming and witty and great socialites, and Dick can make anyone feel at ease, and he's funny and everything like that. They have a remarkable love for one another, but at the same time, Rosemary has a deep, uh, Nicole has a dark secret. On top of that, Rosemary is young and beautiful and attractive, and her head is easily turned by the charm of Dick himself. You see the complex relationship and the, the dilemma, especially for Dick, torn between Rosemary and Nicole. And on top of that, you have these orbiting moons of a cast of very, very well-drawn individuals. Although not grand on the scale of the main three, they all have their effect on everybody else and help you to experience a slice of life. It's very realistic writing. Some of the writing is magical. There's a scene on the terrace at the hotel at night time where they're all sat down for dining um, and how Fitzgerald captures the emotions of them all and the walk along the starlit path. That will stay with you for a long time. But this dark secret just grows very slowly um, and it dawns on you sort of all of a sudden you put the pieces together and you think, oh no, and how it finishes, oh, such pathos, it's great. So I really recommend this book, but it is a bit tough at times. You can feel like you're, you're slogging a little bit, but just slow down and enjoy it for what it is. It's not a rip-roarer like the Scarlet Pimpernel uh, or the Moonstone. It's much more thought-provoking than that. The seventh book on our list is a charming book that will make you laugh. It's really funny, but it's brilliantly executed. There's some great scenes of farce in it as well. Um, but don't let that put you off. It's a great story. It is Our Man in Havana by Graham Greene. Graham Greene is a brilliant writer. So, our main protagonist is a guy called Wormold. Um, that, that tells you straight away. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek. And he lives in Cuba, in Havana. And he is a vacuum cleaner salesman. That's what he does. He has a shop with vacuum cleaners in it. Until one day, someone from British intelligence comes in and convinces him to be a spy in Cuba on behalf of the British government. Now, Wormold hasn't got the first idea of how to do this, and he doesn't find a way to get out of it. But what he does realise very quickly is that even if he makes stuff up, he can get paid quite a lot. And he does have an adolescent daughter who spends all of his money. So he seems to be onto a good thing. And everything's going well until the things he starts making up begin to come true. There are so many funny episodes in this. Um, the, the, some of the reports that go back to Britain and the way the British intelligence agency are reading his reports and, <laughs> and there's a there's a particular um scene where people meet and there's a case of it's not mistaken identity but a thorough talking past one another which will have you on the floor in fits of giggles this is just a superb book it's an entertaining story it's a great way into the classics that they're not daunting pieces of literature um, and if you just like a good read get this book one thing i will say it does use, I believe, on the first page, a racial epithet, and I believe it uses that one as well a little bit later. But um, aside from that, it doesn't say any more, and it's not directly at a person. So use your discretion of what you're happy reading. The eighth classic on our list I had to go and drag out from the dust pile somewhere. I mean, look at the state of this thing. It's also one of my wife's favourite books, if not the favourite book. And it is Villette by Charlotte Bronte. It's a romance story, but it is also a gothic story. So you get a bit of both in this. 
Um, and there's, there's ups and downs, highs and lows, happy and tragic, all going on. It's full, well, I say full, there are numerous plot twists in this, some of which you might see coming, others might just make you go, oh, no, right? <laughs> so the story, we have our protagonist, Lucy, I think she's about 14 years old when she, when this book starts, and she's living with um, a person in the village of Breton, with a bunch of, a little cast of characters like Polly, the six-year-old, and there's also Dr. John, Graham is his, is his um, Christian name. And we just get an introduction to them in that state, but there is a tragedy within the household, within the family, and Lucy then moves to the continent, which is interesting because Charlotte Bronte also moved to Brussels in her lifetime and endured some travails there, which find their way into this book. Later, we see the earlier cast of characters grown up, meeting one another, learning about one another. And a bunch of other people turn up, obviously, in the story because they're in a different part of the world. And there's intrigues, and there's fallings in love, and there's romances. And then there's a nun that keeps turning up. Is she a ghost? It's quite eerie when she turns up, which is why this has a reputation as a gothic novel. And um, there's an a, a undertone to this novel, which is uneasy and somewhat sinister. That's aided by the antagonists who always try to get in the way with their plotting and conniving and scheming to break up the affections of people and whatnot. But the chief thing about this book is how it ends. If you've read it, you will know exactly what I mean. But, ooh, what an ending. And I'm not going to say anything else because that would spoil it. So, if you enjoyed Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, try Villette. My wife would highly recommend you do so. The ninth book on our list of classics is one of my all-time favourite books, and it is Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Now, when I say this book is not for the faint of heart, I don't mean that it's like some grand tome, like the Brothers Karamazov. It's what? 450 pages approximately, but it's not just a straightforward romp through a story. This is Dostoevsky exploring ideas. It's what he was so good at. He's one of the most psychologically astute authors out there, and the Russian tradition tends to go beyond just stories anyway, and to examine life, to paint life as, as well as it can be painted, as real as it can be painted, but then to challenge the way we think and the way our ideas come up against others. So in this book, our protagonist is Rashkolnikov, and he has this worldview, which a lot of the students hold at the time, that there is a ability for some people to not abide by the morals and standards of society, they can step over them in order to achieve the greater good. Now, who Rashkolnikov keeps thinking of is Napoleon. Napoleon had loads of men die in battle in order to build the empire of France and to self-aggrandize himself. And Rashkolnikov sort of looks up to that and he thinks there are characters who can do it. And he wants to be one of them. Now, down the road from him, we, we wake up in the story with him in his little garret room, because he's a student, and he's very morose, depressed, inward thinking, but he's chewing over an idea. He thinks of a woman down the road who is a nasty little miser. He calls her a cockroach. And she's an old lady, and she, she's a pawnbroker. You know, people loan her stuff to get money, and then they lose their stuff. But she keeps growing wealthy and she keeps all this money at home. And he thinks, wouldn't it be better for her to be dead and her money to go to other people? Wouldn't that be better for society? But it'd be a crime to kill her, wouldn't it? Or would it not be a crime if it serves the greater good? And his attitude is that serving the greater good, especially if someone's worthless, you know, that shouldn't be a crime. And so begins an epic tussle of conscience in which he is also pursued by a very, very insightful, almost an all-seeing detective, who without evidence can see through Rashkolnikov and has his suspicions. There is a whole array of characters, including a character who can step over the moral boundaries, but see what Rashkolnikov thinks of him when they meet. This is just a beautiful book. I love it. Um, it's not the easiest one on this list but I would say it's the most rewarding on all of this list, along with East of Eden. 
If Crime and Punishment is the most rewarding of the books on this list, the tenth book is the most beautiful to read, and it is A Room with a View by E.M. Forster. We actually read this in my Patreon group last year. It was so well received. It was the first read of E.M. Forster for many of the patrons, and um, thoroughly enjoyable. It's masterfully written. It's elegant. It's simple. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. Now, what you have, you have uh, Lucy. She is another Lucy. She is abroad in Florence, like the upper middle class do in Edwardian or, or late Victorian England. They go on the grand tour of Europe. And what you, she's accompanied by her um, chaperone, Mrs. Charlotte, or Miss Charlotte, who is quite a, a pinched and peevish figure. And she has a certain way of seeing things. The hotel that they stay in is very English, and yet here they are trying to take in the cultures of another place. The way they go about looking at art is through an English manual telling you what you should think and feel. What Forster does here is he shows how uptight the, the social constructs of Britain have got, the way you behave, the things you're expected to like and appreciate, and also that it's rigid to a point that people have a very narrow view of life. Now, at the beginning, she's given the wrong room. And so one of the characters she meets, an old man who has a son called George, who becomes a bit interesting to Lucy later, he says, oh, we have a room with a view. That's partly why the title is there. But the room is symbolic of your outlook, your how you perceive the world, whether you're close minded or whether you have a room with a view. The way this progresses, primarily around Lucy and George's relation, because she doesn't like him at the beginning, because they're too broad-minded, and how she slowly awakens to the wonders of the world outside of the rules of society. If you break those arbitrary rules down, how much enjoyment is in here? And also has one of my favourite scenes, um, if anyone's read it, you'll know what I mean, the pond scene, where a couple of people and a vicar go swimming in the pond, <laughs> only to be chanced upon by a group of ladies taking a walk. That's a rather good scene, but the whole book is just exceptional. And if you've never read Forster before, this is the book to start with. The penultimate book on our list of classics for 2024 that is really enjoyable um, is a book I read last year. It may have been one of my favourites for the whole year. Um, and the way it's narrated is just, it's just different. It just captures you. It's like a fly on the wall kind of thing. And it is Alone in Berlin by Hans Falada, or Falada, I don't know how you say that. Yes, this is written in third person, present tense. So it describes people moving as, as it happens. So for instance, the opening um, part opening sentences, the postwoman, Eva Kluger, slowly climbs the steps of 55 Jablonski Strass. Now, you see what I mean, it's in the present tense, it's active. Now, this book is set in Nazi Germany, right at the beginning of the war. It's like 1940, the early, early days. And our main characters are Otto and Anna Quangle. They have a son who had been in the war with France, and he's been killed. And this has shook them. A bit. Otto is a very, very reserved, very quiet man, keeps himself to himself. He's a foreman at some local factory. But now they're angry with the Fuhrer because their son died, and what for? And so they decide to mount their own seditious endeavours against the Third Reich. It's only ever so small, but it still involves huge, huge risk. And that is, they start writing little postcards with messages like, mother, why the Fuhrer is killing your children, that kind of stuff. And they leave them, they just drop them in certain buildings. But of course, if you're spotted, you're gonna be handed into the Gestapo. Well, anyway, there is a Gestapo officer, Escherich, who is assigned to catch this person who's leaving these postcards around Berlin. And how he begins to work out and narrow down who it could be, but also, you see the terror of the Gestapo that it holds over everybody and the terror of informers because in the same building that the Quangles live in are the Persics who have a son who's from the Hitler Jugend or the Hitler Youth 
and he is a vehement Nazi. He's completely brainwashed into that direction of things. And of course, they're living right under the nose of these characters. You come across all sorts of individuals with various problems and vices. It's a story of their lives. There is just living. It's not what you call a tight-knit story. It's not that the other lives actually impinge on the Quangles. The Quangles is the story in the middle, but there's lots of things going on around them. It is just great. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, the narration style I just thought was superb. And the way it ends, the way it ends is, again, just a brilliant ending. So um, there's, there's the 11th, Hans Falada's Alone in Berlin. The 12th classic on this list is highly renowned. It is a magnificent piece of work, and yet it's from an author or a playwright that many people are intimidated, intimidated by, and please don't be. It's Macbeth by William Shakespeare. I could have picked many of Shakespeare's, but Macbeth, I find, is a very accessible book once you get into the rhythm of his language. By the way, look in my um, playlist, Shakespeare Explained, and look for stuff on like iambic pentameter and how to understand Shakespeare. Because the story of Macbeth is just, it's the way Shakespeare puts it together. You know, the, the great Hamasha, the, the Hamasha is, is where your one of your great strengths is your downfall. And with Macbeth, his, his vaunting ambition, as it's called, because we start with him being, you know, hailed, hail Thane of Cawdor, the weird sisters, the three witches call him that. He's just helped win a battle for his king, King Duncan. And now Duncan is going to go back to Macbeth's castle and spend the night there before traveling on the next day. And then, because the witches promise Macbeth that he will one day be king, the seed goes in his mind that maybe, if he's going to be king, actually it's his wife, Lady Macbeth, why don't we kill Duncan tonight, kill the king? And the trouble, the, the soliloquies that he goes through, tussling with his own feelings and conscience in front of us, the audience, is this a dagger I see before me, showing me the way because it's pointing the, down the corridor towards Duncan's room? Um, it's just a brilliant use of language. It's a phenomenal play. Shakespeare could catch the human being. Shakespeare got the emotions of humans, separated them out, got this one, which was ambition, the trial of conscience, puts it in a bottle for you to hold and look at. It's like an elixir. And if you swallow it down, you will feel that sense of struggling conscience and that sense of ambition in Macbeth. And of course, the prophecies that work out against him, um, how it all resolves itself with famous lines as well, most famous probably being double, double, toil and trouble, cold, fire burn and cauldron bubble. That's from the Weird Sisters as well. He is a master of a language. If you, if you really want to know what language can do, read Shakespeare. But you might want to watch my video on how to get into Shakespeare first and and the one on iambic pentameter so you can appreciate the beauty of the language so uh, that's the 12th one Macbeth by Shakespeare actually hands down the best piece of literature in the 12 um, as far as writing and insight goes yeah no one matches Shakespeare really I mean that so there were our 12 classics for the year of 2024. If you're trying to get into the classics this year, the, these are definitely the majority you will enjoy. Of course, no one enjoys all books, but these are all really good reads, um, and I, I do recommend all of them. And if you're trying to get into classics, make sure you subscribe because we don't just make lists of books on this channel. We like to dig deep and start finding some of the meanings within and the backgrounds to a lot of the books. Um, and tell me in the comments below which one you like the sound of most. Which one will you start with? The other thing you can do if you want to support my channel and you want to be good to your friends, share this video with anyone you know who likes reading, whether that's an online reading group or a book club, or it could be a Facebook group, or you tweet it to a friend, or you WhatsApp it to someone who you know likes reading. Share this video, it really helps my channel if you share it. And if you want to support me, sharing my videos is one of the best ways you can do it. So until the next time we meet, I wish you joy in whatever you read.